Hey guys, Level Cap here, and over the last year I have gone from gamer to game developer making my own video game C-Beams in Unreal Engine 5. And I've learned so much over that period of time. While some of my ideas about game development were spot on, others were wildly off the mark. And today I want to discuss some of the most important lessons I've learned over the past year of game development and pull back the curtain on some of the mysteries of game dev for everyone else. So I've been documenting the development process of C-Beam since early January of 2024. The point has been to document the process of game development from the literal inception of the game to its completion and leave as little out as possible. That means including our mistakes, our successes, our lessons, everything. And after about a year, we were ready to announce the game name and launch the Steam page where you can go and wishlist the game right now which you should go do. There's a link in the video description. Now, to give you guys proper context, I'm not completely green when it comes to the world of game development. I did work on some apps way back in 2007, and I spent a lot of my time before I was a YouTuber as a 3D animator by profession. So while I'm not totally new to the concepts of game development, most of my knowledge and skill set were pretty out of date by the time we started working on C-Beams. So this project very much was like, starting over for me. Now, the biggest thing that I was reminded of getting back into game dev and sort of really hammered down this time hard is that game development is difficult. Even the simplest concepts of, say, a 2D platformer require complex logic systems that are far deeper and more complicated than anyone could imagine without actually having to do it themselves. To give you just a singular example from this project, to design something like our missile launcher system on our spaceships, we had to design logic for how ships know which missile pod to fire, how to pick which missile tubes to fire from, how to make them progress down a line of missile tubes to launch in sequence, how does a missile rechamber work versus a magazine load, how can we pull ammo from a magazine or from the ship's inventory and put it into a missile launcher, how can we cancel this process at any point, what different circumstances tell the missile launcher whether or not it can fire, how is all of this information communicated to the player via a UI, icons, color changes, sound effects, particle effects, in-game lights and animations. And frankly, for the sake of the pacing of this video, I'm going to leave out the 50 other things that all had to be considered with the missile launcher system, not to mention the most difficult part of it, which was actually creating the flight paths and the interception physics and all that craziness that went into it. The point I'm trying to make is that every single system in the game can seem somewhat simple at first glance, but it almost certainly requires a lot more logic than you might think. It's made me look at every single game system differently, knowing that a huge amount of work has to go into something that may appear to be as simple as a character picking up an object. It's also made me recognize that as the project gets bigger, and more complex, these logic systems that are layered in, the work to change one system can become exponentially more if it's interconnected with other systems in the game. Lots of forethought, smart engineering is needed to create systems that are easy to change later in development. This doesn't mean over-engineering early on or having to fix everything later, probably finding a happy balance in between, but nonetheless, a lot of thought has to go into these systems. Systems. And after about a year of working on these systems, rebuilding, tweaking, iterating, I feel like I can truly appreciate other game projects and the sheer amount of work that's required to make anything work for that matter. I feel very humbled looking at other dev work from across the industry. It requires a work ethic and a work addiction, frankly, that is hard to understand, I think, until you're just right in the thick of it. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is something that I was very much aware of and concerned about before beginning this project, and that is game scope and scope creep. I've learned a lot about it both when it comes to C-Beams productions and also just talking with other developers who are working on their own projects and seeing what they're going through. And as I mentioned earlier, game dev is super hard, which means that any feature you think might be simple is probably not as simple as you thought it was before. 
So what does that mean for game scope? It means that just about any game project out there is probably a lot more complex than you thought it was going to be. And the scope and time required to make that project is going to be pretty big. And I feel like this was a lesson that I was ready to learn going into it. I was prepared for it. I felt like I knew everything that there was to know about scope creep, having watched so many projects uh, crash and burn over the years of being a YouTuber and covering game projects. When that's not going to be me, I'm going to cut my scope back and we're going to start with a very simple, straightforward project. And because of this mindset, I had no problem cutting features and ideas from the original game design. And even so, C-Beams is still a massive project requiring essentially an entire action RPG games framework under the hood, which is a huge amount of work. Plus our own bespoke systems like space physics, unique user interfaces, and all kinds of other challenging bespoke systems needed specifically for our game. One of the first features that I cut from our design document was a ship boarding mini game where essentially you would dock with another ship and then be able to board your crew on it and have some sort of firefight and take over their ship and steal resources and stuff. As soon as I understood a little bit more about what we were doing, it became clear just how massive that feature was going to be. And even cutting that feature, what we're left with is still a very ambitious and large game. So I would say my perspective has absolutely shifted on what is big and what is small in terms of game scope. And it was actually kind of funny explaining my concept to some experienced devs early on and them going, this sounds like a pretty big game that you're designing here. And I was like, no, what are you talking about? It's a top down spaceship game. It's not that complicated. Well, the underlying systems are actually quite complex. Now, why don't we talk about some misconceptions when it comes to game engines and the development process? I had quite a few going into the project. Exciting new engine features and asset store bundles definitely had me excited in the very early days of development. It's easy to watch an Unreal Engine tech demo that shows breathtakingly beautiful environments being manipulated and built at incredible speed. Or asset store bundles that seem like they're going to basically provide half of your in-game assets with no problems whatsoever. As a gamer, I saw a lot of this content and believed that the creative process would be much quicker because because of the ease of access to amazing assets and tools. And while this can be the case in some situations, the reality is that most of these incredible systems need a ton of tailoring and tweaking to work right in whatever your game project is. Jumping into Unreal Engine for the first time, I of course turned on Nanite and Lumen for everything, thinking that it would solve tons of problems with our workflow, which in hindsight, was a bit naive. We found out that a lot of the more marketed features in Unreal Engine 5 weren't necessarily right for the project that we were working on. Due to our fixed top-down camera perspective, we really just didn't have a big need for super high poly models or even different levels of detail since the game camera didn't do a lot of shifting in distance or focus. But for every big flashy feature that we ended up turning off, we found several others that ended up being major workflow improvements that we didn't even know about when we started. For example, we ended up making extensive use of the new world partition system in Unreal Engine 5. I really like working in meta sounds. It gives me tons of control over sound effects and all kinds of complex trigger mechanisms. Rich has been using some new state tree features. He's been using gameplay ability system, aka gas. He's learning how to take advantage of common UI and I'm finding procedural content generation tools to be extremely useful for things like propagating asteroid fields. And I'm anticipating that we'll probably find a bunch of other really cool features that uh, we'll need at some point later in the project. Now, since the very early days of C-Beams and just throwing together gameplay concepts as quickly as possible, I did download quite a few asset store packs that were both paid and free. The vast majority of those systems we uh, either aren't using anymore or we've gotten rid of 99% of them and kept like one texture or one material and then kind of built our own stuff. The reality is, is that a lot of assets you'll get from asset store bundles are maybe not that well 
optimized. They'll end up being built in a way that just doesn't fit in with your game design, or they'll just end up being tools that you use to learn how to build their systems, but just in a different way that's more suitable to your game. And I've heard similar things from other developers and studios where the asset bundles end up just becoming learning experiences more so than tools they actually use to build the final product. Now, an area of game development that I was admittedly far less experienced with when we started was project management. When I started the project, I had a lot more time to spend in engine, teaching myself the tools of Unreal Engine, new workflows. However, due to the public nature of the devlogs, we attracted many interested parties who wanted to help us build this game. This was pretty fantastic, probably a bit different from the average indie dev experience, but it was great to get so much help so early in the project, but what it did for me is that it propelled me into basically a full-time project management role much quicker than I was expecting. And to be honest, I didn't realize just how much of my time was going to be taken up by the logistics side of managing a small team of devs. From contracts to project management software to design documents to art review to regular meetings, my role went from tinkering around an engine and making game assets and exploring ideas to pretty much just making sure that everyone had everything they needed so that they could keep working and moving forward. It became my full-time occupation. And while I've never once doubted the amount of work required to effectively operate as a game producer, being flung into it has given me a entirely new appreciation for the amount of work needed to keep a project running smoothly. Now, I've spent a lot of the last year learning everything there is to know about asset development for video games. This means modeling, texturing, lighting, sounds, particle effects, and pretty much everything in between. I didn't really become an expert on any one of those areas, but I know enough about it to help produce an entire game project now. But when it comes to game design, the art and visuals are all very much intertwined with math. And I sort of thought a lot more of this was gonna be done behind the scenes, but in fact, a lot of it has to come to the foreground where you need to start dealing with shader logic and all the math that is going on to make the assets and artwork in the game look the way you want it to. Now, fortunately, I didn't have to get too deep down this rabbit hole as it keeps going forever and ever. Luckily, we have a couple of really talented tech artists that have been helping us out and helping us figure out how to compute shaders and all that kind of stuff. But it was interesting for me to get a much deeper understanding of vectors and how those actually are colors in themselves and how that computes into shader logic. This was all stuff that I didn't really understand before getting into this. And um, it's been a wild journey seeing just how complicated it is. And I have a huge appreciation for people who can do both the art side and the math side. That is a crazy combination of talents and brain space that I simply don't have. Now, one of the things that I honestly just didn't really factor in accurately at the start of working on C-Beams was how much work all the user interface systems were going to require. It kind of seems obvious in hindsight now that I'm looking at it as the UI has to interact with every single game system in the game essentially. But going into the project, I thought most of our workload was gonna be asset design and level design and world building, but it could easily end up being that UI systems ended up taking most of our effort. The reason for this is that UI inherently needs a custom solution for every problem in the game, from radar to a targeting window to chat boxes to item labels to mission objectives to station interfaces and so on and so forth. Every single one of those systems needs its own bespoke UI that then interfaces with all the other UIs and it gets complicated real fast. I think part of why I didn't really factor in the UI workload as much is that if there's a really good UI or user experience, you're kind of unaware of it for the most part because that is the point of a good UI is to let you focus on the game and not have to worry about 
thinking how much ammo you have or how much fuel you have or all these other things. It should more or less just be known and you should be kind of unaware of how much design work has gone into making sure that you can read that UI as quickly and easily as possible and that it doesn't get in the way of your gameplay. And in that sense, I think I just didn't truly appreciate how much work, how much depth and thought has to go into these systems. And thus, I didn't really account for it that well early in the project. So with a year and some change of game development under my belt, I definitely look at game development very differently now. I have a new appreciation for the difficulty and the brilliance required to achieve great results in game devs. Solo devs are still an enigma to me. The skill set required, the workload needed to solo develop a game is truly insane. I'm glad I didn't try and solo dev my own project. I think it's way more fun to collaborate and even dividing all the game dev tasks amongst a small team. Everybody's still doing a lot of different things, so it stays pretty interesting. In hindsight, there's probably a few things I would have changed about my approach to this project. One that I can say for sure is that I would have tried getting into project management software much earlier. I'm glad we're fully into it now, but some of my original design documents might have been laid out a bit better and gotten more future use had I integrated it to some of our project management software from the early days. I also would have spent more time establishing the game's lore early on. For whatever reason, I figured that story could kind of come later in the project, but it's difficult because the lore influences a lot of your design and thus, once you get to the design phase, you go, wait a minute, we need to pull from lore to influence our design. And now it becomes a full circle and you go, oh, should have done that earlier on. That said, this is very hindsighty of me in the early phases of the project. I was mostly concerned about all these unknown gameplay systems and whether or not they were going to be fun. That was my primary concern. So now that we're kind of past that part of development, uh, I'm looking at inefficiencies with the project and going, uh, yeah, we really could use some of that backstory now to help uh, flesh out some of this logo work and this branding style for these corporations and stuff. And now we got to build the lore so that we can then do that design work. Otherwise, I feel extremely fortunate with where we are in development right now. I'm extremely happy with the progress that we're making. I'm really excited about some upcoming um, goals that we're aiming for, and I think things are going to open up in really interesting ways very quickly. Getting some of the scarier design ideas out of the way early on has made me feel far more confident about the project actually being fun to play, which is cool. I have no illusions about just how much more work is still left for us to achieve a final product for C-Beams, but I am so excited for all of the challenges that lay ahead of us. I hope this video has been at the very least entertaining for you guys to watch, and at most I hope it's helpful for other devs out there setting realistic goals for your games, better anticipating scope of your projects and all the challenges that may lay ahead. I'd also be curious to hear from other indie devs in the comments about what were some of the biggest epiphany moments or biggest learning curves you had to face when building your own games for the first time. Maybe those are things that we're going to run into this year. So hearing about them now would certainly help. And again, if you want to follow this project more closely, I would one recommend wishlisting C beams. If you haven't done so already, there's a link in the video description. You can follow us on discord for more close and nuanced updates to what we're working on. And you can check out the rest of the devlogs here. Next devlog is going to be a little more traditional. So thank you guys so much for dropping by. I appreciate y'all and we'll see you next time. This is Level Cap signing off.